You know, it's the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, and we just couldn't let that go unacknowledged and uncommemorated. Um, before that time, I'm going to let our speakers do all of the, the speaking, but just by way of introduction, um, you know, the Independence War of 48, 67, these were moments of real victory and uplift in Israel, a feeling of security that that while we'd always be surrounded by enemies, that we would always prevail in the end. And the Yom Kippur War of 73 really flipped that on its head. It was really an existential scare, and it, it caused us to reconsider just how safe and secure we were. Thank God it was still a victory, and we're still here uh, and, and going strong, uh, though obviously internal challenges we're all aware of, but we're here. Um, so we are so blessed and lucky to have um, so many terrific members of our community who have stories to share, either from direct involvement or through family and loved ones who, um, who, who fought in the war, who volunteered in the war, who dropped everything um, to, to protect our country, to protect our homeland. So we're very privileged to hear from a number of our wonderful um, members of our, of our community. Um, I also just want to start by giving a brief uh, thank you and Yasher Koach to our committee who, who made this all possible. Um, if you're on the committee, would you mind standing up so we could acknowledge you and give you a round of applause? Um, Gary Orkin couldn't be here. Uh, he, he also a uh, very, very hardworking member of our committee. Have I left anyone out? I want to make sure. Is there anybody on our committee not here who I haven't acknowledged? Okay, well, I'll make sure by the end of the night that you're all acknowledged, but thank you, thank you. Our story walk is outside, so we encourage you to check it out if you haven't yet. Um, without further ado, we're going to get started with song. Uh, Cantor is going to lead us. I'm going to pass out some song sheets, um, a couple of songs that are, are on the theme of the Yom Kippur War or inspired by it. I'll let Cantor uh, describe as I pass these out, and then we're going to hear from our first batch of speakers. Then we'll have uh, another song break, and then our final batch of speakers. And we're going to end with a Q&A session with Yaakov Paxer. Um, so you'll have a, a little chance for um, participation. Uh, thank you again for being here. Hello, everyone. Um, so this song is by Naomi Shemer and, uh, you know, who is well known as uh, one of the primary um, famous, well-known um, songwriters, composers for the state of Israel. And, um, and she writes beautiful poetry, let alone the music, right, that expresses it. And um, this particular prayer um, this song and prayer is, is may it come to pass all of the things that we hope for. It evokes a sense of longing that um, is um, brought up through the emotional turmoil that you go through when, you know, when you're confronted with um, something as stark um, as the Yom Kippur war. And so it has, it has strong connections, the song to, the, ha the events of the Yom Kippur War. And so I think many of you probably do know this one or you can catch on. So if you have the song sheet, please sing with me. Oh, <laughs> 
Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm not looking. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm not looking. Caution, to pin. Caution, nevakesh, lo yehi. Lo tishama betokol ela, gam tvila achat mi pi. Caution, nevakesh, lo yehi. Lo yehi, lo yehi, na na nevakesh, lo yehi. Do ye no ye na no Caution never case, do ye he? Koshen nevakesh, lo yehi. Lo yehi, lo yehi, na na lo yehi. Koshen nevakesh, lo yehi. Lo yehi, lo yehi, na na lo yehi. Koshen nevakesh, lo yehi. One more time. Lo yehi, lo yehi. Our first speaker is Dan Ostrian. I think it's my first time that I'm giving a speech. Yeah, to the mic. My name is Donnie Austrian. You can hold it if you want to, either way, whatever is more comfortable. My name is Donnie Austrian. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in Israel. Uh, can, you hear, can you hear me now? <laughs> Two inches. Okay. I was born in Israel. Got uh, educated in Israel. I uh, served in the military. Went to basic training and uh, officers training. And uh, served in uh, artillery. At the end of my uh, service of two and a half years, I was a commander of a artillery battery, which is part of three batteries of the whole unit. Uh, during the service, we were called many times to the Syrian border because Syrians were acting and uh, came back. Uh, I was released uh, from... Uh, regular mandatory service and uh, at the end of uh, 1966. And then uh, was uh, recruited, not recruited, but actually mandatory uh, positioned on reserves in a artillery unit. Uh, we went through the six day war and uh, war of attrition in the Suez Canal and uh, later on, a uh, variety of uh, training and uh, Yom Kippur War. Uh, when Yom Kippur broke uh, out, I was already working as uh, three and a half years as a consulting engineer uh, in Tel Aviv. I uh, graduated from the Technion as mechanical engineer, got married to my dear wife, Tsiona. Uh, 
and uh, worked as a consulting engineer in a prominent uh, firm in Tel Aviv. On Yom Kippur Day, as many Israelis, uh, I was uh, in the synagogue with uh, Tziona's uh, family, uh, grandfather, father, father, uh, uncle, and other cousins. And uh, when the sirens broke out, it was about two o'clock in the afternoon when the sirens broke out. We stayed in shelter nearby of a family apartment, and then we went to Tziona's parents' uh, home. And after everybody gathered there, the whole family, uh, we went to our apartment uh, to in give a time. Uh, there I uh, prepared my uh, army backpack and waited for the call to be deployed. The call came about uh, eight o'clock in the evening. So we all went to a place where many of uh, my unit uh, colleagues or reservists and soldiers were waiting and uh, our warehouse for the battery uh, for the the whole unit was uh, near Haifa. Takes about time uh, at night, about an hour and a half to get there. We prepared our unit, but uh, we didn't uh, join immediately to the fighting and to the Golan Heights. We trained and were usually uh, positioned or assigned to the Golan uh, area. Uh, obviously the tanks uh, used uh, most of the uh, uh, trailers that uh, carried them as fast as possible to the border. And our unit was waiting and, uh, but we were supposed to move ahead. So we basically moved on our own force and uh, my tanks, which was uh, my cannons, which were self-propelled uh, cannons, basically did the road under chains. Didn't have any uh, trailers to take us faster to the, to the border and to, the, to support the fighting units. Um, it took us about uh, two days to get there. And uh, we were reservist units. So all my units, everybody was basically reservist. We didn't have any uh, members in the unit that were mandatory service. They were already uh, deployed ahead of us to various locations, many of them to the Sinai and the Suez. We were going to the uh, Golan. Uh, units, uh, a artillery unit is basically comprised of three batteries. Each battery had uh, four cannons. And uh, my unit, we started with uh, self-propelled tank uh, cannons of 105 millimeters caliber. We had uh, about 70 soldiers under my command and each battery had about 70 soldiers plus other support units uh, that were trailing behind us with uh, ammunition, uh, pet, uh, gasoline and uh, food and so on. But they were usually trailing behind us. They were not right with us as we were uh, supporting the units. Uh, Uh, but when when we when we when we arrived uh, on the third day, immediately we got targets assigned, and uh, we were shelling the Syrian army as much as we can, in order to help the infantry and the armor units to move ahead. And by that time, the the Syrian army was already starting to retreat, even though there were a lot of. Uh, conclaves, uh, enclaves of uh, fighting and resisting. And uh, some of uh, the units had very heavy fighting. Uh, one of the commanders in our units uh, in the battery was assigned to the, to the infantry. 
uh, right on the and the paratroopers right on the first line in the fighting there, and he was directing our units for targets to shell. Unfortunately, uh, one day he was uh, hit with a bullet in his head, and he was the only one in our whole unit who died during the uh, Yom Kippur War. His name is uh, Koach Elchanan. His name is in the book of uh, memory of uh, all the soldiers, uh, which is outside. Uh, the fighting and shelling, uh, major one, continued for about 18 days until we had the first uh, mini ceasefire, uh, contemplating and negotiating ceasefire. But still, there were units who were fighting, but not very heavy. At that time, in this uh, mini-series, uh, uh, we were allowed to go down from the Golan to the Kibbutz Ayelet HaShachar, where uh, we got our first uh, shower. We had a uh, change of clothes, shaved our beards, and uh, also had the opportunity uh, to call home and let them know that we are alive, we are good, we are here uh, for a little re relief or whatever you want to call it. When uh, Tsiona's father got the word that I'm there, took Tsiona in the car, they drove three hours to the to the Ayelet Toshacha, where we met. Mm. Uh, had a conversations, but uh, shortly after that, about an hour, we were uh, called that we have to go back. Just as we were ready, getting ready to go back, there were shelling in the neighborhood from the Syrian army. And we had to stay for another about two hours in shelter in the kibbutz before we were allowed to uh, get on our trucks and get back to the to the unit. After the war ended, uh, my unit still say, stayed in position in the Golan Heights for a long five months. You can imagine uh, away from the family, away from jobs, and away from normal civilian life. It's almost like going back to mandatory service, being there five months. Every once in a while, you could go back, uh, get the after duty, so-called, go home for a weekend and come back. Uh, during that time of the five month, my unit was uh, converted from 105 millimeter self-propelled uh, cannons to 175 millimeter self-propelled cannons. Uh, that we got from the United States Army, and it was still in their original racks. During the uh, training, the first thing that we had to do was unwrap everything, clean up from grease and everything, and then uh, study and learn and train. What is it all about? It was brand new unit for the Army. Nobody had it before. We were trained, and after the training, we went back to the Golan Heights. Uh, during uh, a after one of the after duties that I had, and coming back, I'm being called immediately to get move, move, move. A commander, a command car was waiting for me, and I. Uh, it was uh, deployed immediately to my unit, wherever they were stationed. The unit was already uh, packed and ready to move. We got uh, the orders to move to a certain position, which was just on the border with the Syrians. And there we got uh, orders to shell the suburbs of Damascus. It was a very intense day. We were shelling uh, nonstop. Uh, each battery, each uh, cannon in my unit was uh, shelling almost uh, two truckloads of shells. It was a very intense event. 
And for me, in every unit, there are three officers, one who helps to set up the location of each tank. You don't have them all side, side by side. They are spread apart. Then there is another uh, officer who is in charge of getting the uh, tenants directions how to elevate or uh, the the cannons direction and me basically running around and making sure that everybody is okay in between helping every cannon to break down bundles of uh, uh, missiles uh, shells sending them down from the truck to the soldiers I don't know how I made it but at that time you don't think about it and each one of them each shell was in the neighborhood of uh, 180 pounds. And you just lift it up, take it down, and move on. It was a very intense day, but we did what we had to do, finished, went back to the position that we were before that. Uh, about a week later, after the shelling, the word uh, came about that uh, everybody in the Israel knew that uh, we shelled the suburbs of Damascus and a newspaper reporter showed up trying to interview. At the beginning, I was a little bit resistant. I didn't really want to have a, any interview, but he convinced us to interview us and uh, have an article in the weekend newspaper. And a copy of that is uh, a photo of it is there copy of that article or that uh, news week, weekend newspaper is here with the uh, headline, the cannons who shelled the suburbs of Damascus. Some photos of uh, the units, some photo of my uh, uh, comrades and uh, one photo yours truly. Uh, we were we were released at the end of uh, February 1974 with orders to be deployed six weeks later for another six weeks. Ongoing saga. At the end of those nine uh, six weeks, came back home, went back to civilian life, get back acquainted with my desk at work and uh much later had another call of training uh, time and uh that was the story of uh my yom kippur experience yes there were it wasn't easy there were intense times uh during the the war and the fighting uh i can recall one time that uh, when we were in position at the beginning and the Syrians were not uh, pushed back all the way, there were a couple of helicopters, Syrian helicopters that were still had the guts to uh, pass by out of the open doors. Uh, they were firing uh, machine guns. We returned the, fi the fire to them. Obviously, everybody had to spread out from their cannons returned the fire. I don't know if we did or because of other units nearby that uh, were stationed about 300 yards beyond passing by, there was a big flame. The helicopter went down. If it was us, we take the credit. If it wasn't us, we moved on. <laughs> so other intents, well, obviously the shelling of uh, Everything was intense. Everything is intense. 18 days of intense fighting. You hardly sleep. You don't know where you are, where it's going to be the next day, hour, the next day. And we made it. We made it. Uh, I don't want to say lucky for us, but in the army, in the military, artillery is in the back, in, in, in the back line. My artillery had long range uh, capability. capability to shell with the 175 millimeters. The target is about 45 kilometers. 
it's about 30 miles of target. So you are not on the first line. We were lucky we didn't suffer any casualties. Unfortunately, there are over 2,000 soldiers who died in the Sinai and in the Golan. So I have. We're going to call up Helena next, and I just, because I neglected before, I just want to say it, this is a really difficult topic, obviously, to talk about, and it's something, you know, when we decided we were going to do this, we reached out to other synagogues to see, is anybody else doing this, and I, we had we heard virtually no, and I think the reason is it's such a difficult topic, people didn't want to uh, subject people to remember and to recall because of how painful it is, the PTSD, the trauma of it all, so we we just want to acknowledge again uh, how difficult it is to share and to tap back into these memories, and we hope that we're creating a safe space uh, to to hear and bear witness to those stories because of how holy and important it is to remember. So thank you for 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 sharing and and for letting us hear, uh, Helena. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Thanks for coming. Can you hear? No, pull it out. Okay. Okay. I'm Halina Podlipsky. I was born in a Dick P camp in Hanover, Germany, to Holocaust survivors. We moved to Israel after the British allowed us to go there in 1949. So I was raised in Israel, educated in Israel, met my husband in medical school in Hadassah, Jerusalem. And I didn't go, I went to the different route. I didn't go first to the army. We were at Udaim, uh, which means you study and then basically you sold, you sold your soul to the army for the rest of your life. Mm. Um, so when Yom Kippur, so we married in 71 and we went to, to study, to do our internship. And my husband, after the internship, had to go and fulfill his army duties. I was assigned in Bellinson Medical Center, and I worked as an anesthesiologist and in intensive care there, um, doing my residency first, of course. When, uh, when my husband was in the Air Force, so he used to come, he was in Sinai, and he came three days every six weeks to be with me and our young infant. She was 10 months old then. Um, happened for Yom Kippur, he was home. He came home for that weekend. And uh, we lived in Ramat Gan, which was not far from Sdedov, which is an Air Force base, a small Air Force base in the north of Tel Aviv. And usually, whoever doesn't live in Israel during Yom Kippur doesn't know how it feels. There is no sound, no telephone, no airplane, no radio, nothing. It's like total silence. That evening, there was no silence. And I kept saying, something is wrong. Something is not normal. I hear airplanes. And never, never on Yom Kippur, for all the years that I lived until the Yom Kippur War, there was any airplanes going. And I told, discussed it with my husband, and I say, uh, what's going on? Something is going on. And I said, don't worry, since I'm in active duty, they, I will be the first one to be deployed. Sure enough, about... Two in the morning, that was 
12 hours before the war started. He got a call to get ready that a, that a truck will come and pick him up. So I knew before most of the people in the country that something is happening. We were lucky, and I don't know, it was a blessing that it was Yom Kippur, that no one was on the streets and we could deploy the whole country, all the reservists. Otherwise, we would be non-existent. It was really beshared to survive. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked me a few days ago, how could they deploy so many, so many people in such a small period of time? And everybody was in synagogue. Everybody, everybody knew exactly where everybody is. So it was easy to contact everybody and to get everything going. And you know, Israel is a small country. One person knows, then 10 persons knows, you know. Um, so when they took my husband, I picked up my daughter with all her stuff. She was 10 months old. And I took her to my parents in Ramat Gan, not far from me. And I went to my position in Bellinson Hospital. My daughter suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. She stopped talking totally. Whenever there was an alarm, my parents used to take her three flights down to the shelter and go back. They were not young, obviously. And uh, she never saw me for almost two and a half weeks. I was stationed in the hospital was a main hospital. I know there will be a lot of people talking about the soldiers in the south and in the north and everything that happened. I want just to talk a little bit about the people in the background, okay? Like me, we were positioned in a place. We had patients in the hospital. We had to evacuate all the patients that were able to be evacuated that were not in life and the situation, like after open heart or something like this. We evacuated them to smaller peripheral hospitals because our hospital was one of the main hospitals that treated everything. Treated open hearts, neuro, chest, burns. We evacuated all the ortho floors all the OBGYN, everything. And we prepared for mass casualties, which was a very smart move because they started to come after two o'clock in the afternoon with helicopters and with trucks, massive. I'll never forget the smell of burnt soldiers, burnt flesh. Till the day I die, <laughs> unless I get out. <clears throat> it was so awful. Patients came without limbs, with trauma to the head, to the chest. To the... We didn't have time. There were some people that were sorted, the patients in the emergency room. The rest of us, we were non-stop in the operating room. Have to realize that most of the males in the hospitals were gone. They were also deployed to their units. So we were mostly women and foreigners that came, that volunteered to come and work. Um, a lot of Arab physicians came to help. Um, We didn't stop working day and night. I don't know by sheer adrenaline. I have no idea how we could sustain so many hours. It was like one came in, one came out, one came in, one came out. We didn't leave the operating room. We had more than 16 operating rooms in the main building. <coughs> and then we had in the peripheral, like in OBGYN, 
we had the extra operating room. Um, I don't want to describe the horrors that I saw because you'll, it will give anybody nightmares. Um, we did it. We didn't have a choice. We fought for our country and our livelihood. Most of us were people from all over the world, from Turkey, from Poland, from Hungary, from Romania, from everywhere, from Arab nation. And we, we knew that we don't have a choice. We don't want a repeat Holocaust like it was in Europe. I was lucky that my husband was in the Air Force. So each time he brought with helicopters from the South wounded, he would wherever he could get to a telephone. That was before cell phones, guys. <laughs> he would call and say, I'm alive. So he wouldn't get me because I was busy in the door, but he would get the secretary who would say, I got a message from Alex. He's okay. My brother was not so lucky. He was with Ari Sharon in the South. And they were on the front line. Shells and bombarded right and left. Uh, he doesn't know when he came back finally, he doesn't know how he survived. And he came home religious because he said there is a God if he survived the ordeal that he had. He was three months in, uh, in the Sinai and we didn't know if he's alive or dead. He was longer than three months. Yeah. And after three months, one of his wounded comrades, um, he wrote on a, on a Kufsat Gafurim, on a yeah. box. Yeah. I'm alive, Yossi. And this guy who went to the hospital sent it to my parents, and that's how they realized that he's alive. That's in a nutshell. We are very lucky that we survived it. And as I said, it was lucky that all the streets were empty, that we could deploy everybody so quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Next, we have David Ashpis, followed by a music break. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, David Ashpis. I was born in Israel in 1950. My parents came also in 1950 to Israel. And um, I went to, uh, well, first of all, I have to say, I didn't go through, I was in the front. I didn't go through combat like all, all the other people did. And I feel very fortunate and that's because I was in the Air Force. Um, I was in a program, the Atuda Academics that Alina mentioned. It can be translated to Academic Reserve. It's a special program where you go to a college, to school first, and then you do your service after you finish, and uh, most times in the profession you're required. So I studied in uh, the Technion, studied the aeronautical engineering, and I was uh, uh, assigned to the Air Force. Um, so um, after doing uh, officer training and um, uh, some other training, I was assigned to an airbase called Tel Nof, and um, it was uh, near Rehovot, south of Tel Aviv. It was a very large air force uh, airbase, and this is the the patch. It was called, called air, Airbase Number Eight, and you wear this here. Uh, later, I was in uh, headquarters in a development, research and development unit, and that was the patch. So I have the, this memorabilia. And um, so I was assigned to Tel Nov. There was a, a depot there that did the major refurbishments of aircraft uh, and uh, had the different shops, structural shops, engines, hydraulics, electronics, so on. And I was in the engineering department, and we supported all those activities in the engineering matters. 
So I was there only for a, a few months, maybe five or six months, uh, when the war broke. So I was home on Yom Kippur, uh, and it was quite early. I got a phone call from my boss to come back to uh, the base. He didn't tell me why. Uh, we were on call for some certain duty, and I thought that's why I'm being called back. <clears throat> and um, I went on uniform, and I went out to, to hitchhike. And I was wondering, how am I going to get to the base? Because I was totally clueless uh, as what's happening. Turned out there was traffic. There were cars driving at that time. Like Alina said, uh, people, uh, even secular people, were, were quiet. They were not driving on, on uh, Yom Kippur. Uh, but there was traffic and was able to hitchhike uh, all the way to to the base. And um, as, as uh, it was, I was in Haifa, and as I was going south to towards Tel Aviv, more and more people were on the roads hitchhiking. So it was obvious that something is happening, but nobody knew what. When I arrived to the base, and uh, as they told us that there's intelligence that uh, the Egyptians are going to attack us and we're going to attack them first at two o'clock. <clears throat> and um, the dining room was open. I remember going to eat on Yom Kippur and I remember what we ate, <laughs> uh, smoked turkey legs. <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> uh, and uh, we were in the engineers. We, we had nothing to do at, at that moment. So we were hanging out there and at two o'clock, we our um, structure where we worked was near the runway. We walked over close to the runway to see all the airbase going up in the air with bombs and missiles, and it is, should have been a sight to see. But instead, there was a siren and nothing happened. And uh, then came news that the Egyptian crossed the Suez Canal, uh, the, the the Syrians attacking us. And we're standing there, and I, I tell my friends, I, I have a feeling that they caught us with our pants down. Because the atmosphere before was a lot of confidence and arrogance in Israel. And this is really the reason that it brought us the war. Nobody wanted to prepare. Nobody wanted to believe uh, uh, in all the intelligence that, that something is happening. Uh, so uh, I remember my friends laughed at me when I said that. But it was really true. Uh, we had, uh, we were young, we didn't have much experience. We just started our careers. and But we had uh, one guy, he was a little bit more experienced, maybe a year or two older than us. And he told us that what we're going to get is a lot of damaged airplanes and we're going to uh, need to do all kinds of uh, engineering uh, for repairing those airplanes and, and to hit manuals and see how it's done. So we sat and we looked at manuals to see how you, Repair uh, damaged airplanes, structure repairs, bullet holes, the uh, major repairs, and uh, it, it really happened. After a few days, we started to uh, get uh, a lot of airplanes that got damaged, and uh, were able to return. And uh, most of the damage was in the tail, and uh, they were damaged by uh, missiles that were infrared missiles, and they're home to the heat of the exhaust uh, uh, tail. And I was always thinking about the pilots who uh, were doing this close support and got hit by those missiles. Those are missiles from uh, usually short range and uh, not high altitude and uh, endangering themselves and then getting hit, hit and being able to, to bring the airplane back. Uh, so um, uh, uh, we, we got a lot of uh, those airplanes and we were helping. We had technicians and knew what to do, but a lot of times you need to do uh, some engineering uh, repairs. We had a few uh, unusual repairs that we had to improvise things and save uh, whole airplanes um, uh, for, from basically being thrown away. Uh, so that we uh, showed some creativity there, you know, all kinds of repairs. But the major challenge was when those airplanes were burned is to decide uh, to how, how much to repair. Uh, when it's burnt and the metal is mangled, you know you have to cut and replace, but how far does it go? Because when, when uh, the temperature is high, the metal gets weak. So we did sort of research how to, um, how, how to measure the properties of, of the metal uh, in order to decide where, where to, to cut. We, uh, uh, we had uh, two two types of airplanes. We have the Skyhawk, 
and that was one robust airplane. Uh, a lot of them came back with uh, damage, uh, damage in the tail, and they're very simple and strong airplanes. Um, uh, it was very easy to take the tail apart. So we actually got a lot of tails where uh, we got uh, new tails in boxes that were replaced, and we we had all, all these tails to to fix. But then there was the other airplane, the Phantom. And in the bag, the structure was made of titanium, which is a stronger uh, metal. Uh, but um, it was very difficult to understand uh, how strong it is after the fire. And uh, one interesting uh, aspect was that the titanium changes color when it's in fire. And I remember we made samples of titanium, put them in ovens, and baked them to see how, how the color gets correlated with, with the temperature. But then turned out that all our efforts were in vain. It, it was uh, all, all this stuff depended very much on the precise uh, uh, metallurgical composition of the metal, the heat treatment of the metal, and uh, we we really failed essentially to to do it in a scientific way. But we spent a lot of a lot of time on it, and at the end we just did it by touch. We just with bare fingers touching the skin of the airplane and feeling, trying to feel where it's wavy. And where we feel it's ended, we tell them, well, cut, cut it another uh, two or three feet from there. Um, uh, so, uh, but the, feel, the feeling uh, in the airbase was not good. Uh, the first days was very quiet. You expect a lot of flights, takeoffs, landings. It was very quiet. And uh, apparently after suffering some losses in airplanes and uh, pilots, they just uh, didn't fly as much and they uh, were waiting for uh, jamming equipment, electronic warfare equipment that came uh, maybe a few days, took days or a week or 10 days to come. There was uh, this the giant uh, uh, airplanes, the American uh, air, uh, brought a lot of equipment, they brought the, this equipment and I think that's what allowed the Air Force to, to, to operate. Um, I had uh, in my room, uh, I was living on the base, so in my room they put a reservist and he was flying cargo airplanes and he they didn't fly at night so he used to come spend telling me that what he was doing all day is fly uh, wounded and uh, and uh, killed uh, soldiers from the Sinai uh, all day, and that was pretty upsetting to to hear about uh, all this, the element of the surprise. And uh, as as other news came, it was even uh, more depressing hearing about uh, Israeli soldiers surrendering, or let's say forced to surrender, a huge amount of casualties. It was uh, very difficult, but uh, I was in the airbase. I felt safe. Uh, I felt fortunate not to be in combat, uh, which was uh, pretty tough. Um, I, after the war, we had a lot of work continuing with all those repairs, but it just worked. It's, uh, it's not uh, terrible. And everybody was in the war. I have some... Uh, Souvenirs got this uh, badge, the war badge. Mm -hmm. You wear it here, and it's. Uh, uh, I was in the regular army, so I altogether I was six years in the air force. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's what uh, we did during the war. Thank you. So this uh, this song, Leonard Cohen song um, that he wrote, inspired by um, his his visit um, to Israel in in the wake of the Yom Kippur War, and he was inspired by the Unatana Tokef prayer that we say at the High Holy Days, and um, so he wrote this this version. Um, in the wake of the empty poor war. Who by fire, who by water, who in the sunshine, who in the nighttime, who by high ordeal, 
who by common trial, who in your merry, merry month of May, who by a very slow decay, and who shall I say is calling, who in her lonely slip, who by barbiturate, who in these realms of love, who by something blunt, who by avalanche, who by powder, who for his greed, who for his hunger, and who shall I say is calling, and who by brave ascent, who by accident, who in solitude, who in this mirror, who by his lady's command, who by his own hand, who win mortal chains, who win power, who shall I say is calling by fire, who by water, who win the sunshine, who win the night time. Who by high ordeal, who by common trial, who in your merry, merry month of May, who by very slow decay, shall I say is calling. Sheila Alenick? So I'm I'm very humbled to be up here with uh, the people who have already spoken. My story is a little bit different. A um, little bit of background. My name is Sheila Alenick. I grew up in Cleveland Heights. First went to Israel with Henry Margolis on the Bureau of Jewish Education trip when I was 16. And then after that, the two summers after, my friend Amy Gobstein and I were very fortunate to be at the Apple Children's Village in Ganyavna, which is a small town near Ashdod. Um, the thought was we were going to be there to volunteer and help these kids. These are kids who were had different troubles she in their lives, but really they didn't expect. The mic. They didn't expect much from us, and we hitchhiked through the country and enjoyed oh, themselves. Um, I met a young man during uh, the first year that I did that, and had a relationship for the next four years with this young man. Um, so then after those two summers, um, I was 18 and went off to Ohio State University to start my college career. So three weeks into my college experience at Ohio State, the war broke out in Israel. My heart was torn between Israel and my family being in the United States. Um, and as others have said, this wasn't just any war. This was a war where the existence of Israel was at, at stake. Um, the news broadcasts were dire. And there was a rally in uh, Columbus to help raise money for the war effort. Um, there was a bus of students that went from Hillel to uh, this big uh, auditorium in Columbus. And I joined with the group and, and went to this rally. I don't remember the details of the speeches, but I do remember the feeling in the room. And there was a mixture of dread because the war had, was so dire, pride because we knew that the Israelis were resilient and we had faith that they would persevere, and enthusiasm because we were there to raise money. And that was one thing we could really do to raise, to, to help the war effort. It was the first time that I had ever seen someone stand up and pledge a million dollars for the state of Israel. And it, it was very meaningful. So after the rally, we all piled into this van that took us from the campus. And one woman in this uh, van was very, very agitated. And she hooked on to me and took my arm and she said to me, God puts all of us on this earth to do something. And if you don't do what God puts you on this earth to do, you're sinning. And don't be a sinner like I am. And with that, she opened the back of the van in the middle of traffic and left the van. Wow. 
I thought God was speaking to me, right? <laughs> I mean, I I knew that that it was up to me to do something. So at the very same time, the Aliya office in Cleveland was getting volunteers together to go work on the kibbutzim because the kibbutzniks were all being called up for the war effort. Israel was largely an agricultural based economy at the time and the crops were falling from the trees. And if people weren't there to pick the, uh, the fruit that was ripening, then you know the Israeli economy was going to tank and that's one thing they didn't need at the same time that a war was going on. So um, I came back to Cleveland and I had to go through a medical exam. I decided I, I was gonna volunteer, right? So I had to go through a medical exam um, because obviously they didn't want a whole bunch of kids arriving in Israel with mental or physical problems that would just compound the issues that were already going on there. Um, Dr. Kazakoff of blessed memory did a physical. My parents knew Dr. Kazakoff, wanted him to say that I was not medically fit. <laughs> But he did not bow to their pressure. He gave me the green light and I was approved to, to go to Israel as a volunteer. Um, I flew from Cleveland to New York, uh, met up with, there were about a hundred of us, um, but we were in small groups. And my group um, was delayed and was not able to fly to Israel right away. There were a lot of Israelis that were trying to get back into the country. There were a lot of politicians who were flying into the area to negotiate peace. And so um, the group that I was with was delayed and we didn't leave for Israel until 24 hours after we were supposed to leave. Okay, so you have to understand my parents are sitting at home next to the telephone trying to find out where I am and when I'm arriving. So this is a 24 hour period where they had no idea. Um, and then it was very, very difficult to fly to Israel at that time because the Arab countries viewed non-Israelis coming into the area as mercenaries. And there were the countries in Europe did not want to um, be seen as helping mercenaries come into Israel. So we had to fly from New York to Italy, and then from Italy to, no, New York to France, and then from France to Italy in order to um, get approval to get to fly into Israel. And, um, it was, it was very intense because uh, they wouldn't tell us anything. And each time we um, deplaned, we were kept confined into a small room. We weren't allowed to leave the room except escorted. And we didn't know if that was for our safety or not, but um, it was very unnerving. Um, my friend Andy, who I met, 50 years ago, who we're, I'm still friendly with today, reminded me that when we flew into Israel, that the plane had to turn all its lights off. And only when we were one hour from the Israeli airport did the lights come back on because we wanted to avoid um, whoever knowing that we were flying into, into Israel. The atmosphere on the, on the plane was very somber. Again, there were Israelis that were returning home to join their units, to see their families. There were a lot of Orthodox that were continually praying the entire time. Um, and we arrived on October 12th, six days after the start of the war. So here we are, a bunch of young American kids, and we're gathered in this big conference room, and we're giving a, given a choice of assignments. The group that I met in New York sort of stuck together, and we opted to go to Kibbutz Rishafim, which is in the Beit Shan Valley, very close to the Jordan border. Jordan hadn't joined the war, but um, there was a concern about what the situation was going to be there. But Kibbutz Rishafim is a small kibbutz. It's a Shomir Atzair kibbutz. They have uh, grapefruit, orchards, fish ponds, cows, turkeys, various other means of uh, making money. But the, the orchards were their prime um, source of income and the fruit was ripe and the fruit was falling off the trees. So there were about uh, 15 of us that went to Rishafim and my friend Andy and I were the only ones who of the volunteers that spoke any Hebrew. Um, we were assigned rooms 
all the guys were together. I was the only female in the uh, volunteer group. So I was ushered into a room with volunteers who had been on the kibbutz prior to the war. And whereas the volunteer group was very homogeneous, uh, all Jewish, all from the United States. The volunteers that were on the kibbutz scene were from all over. A lot of them weren't Jewish. A lot of them didn't have a uh, true um, feeling for the state of Israel. It was just a, you know, a, a vacation for them. Anyway, that made it a little more challenging for me to acclimate, but I did. Our accommodations were sparse, but nothing like what the soldiers uh, had to deal with up on the front line. It was eerily quiet on the kibbutz. There were very few un individuals under the age of 50. Um, there were young children, and then there were the older people, and it was very quiet. There was no music. There was, it was just not a usual situation, obviously. Um, so we picked grapefruits for weeks. I don't know if you're familiar with grapefruit trees, but they have prickers on them. And all of us had scars all over our hands. So you knew who, who was working in the grapefruits. Um, and I was lucky because my boyfriend was not in, in a front line. He was guarding an army barracks and he was in close proximity to where I was on the kibbutz. So I did get to see him at the side, at the very same time. Bob, my now husband of 44 years, <laughs> was also in Israel. And he was on a Sharut La'am program um, where it was a program where you did Olpan. And then this was for people who had already graduated from college because he's older than I am. <laughs> and um, so you did uh, the Olpan and then you worked in your profession. Um, so he repeatedly has told me the story of how he was on the Mirpeset, the porch of his apartment Yom Kippur, having eggs for breakfast. And uh, and he saw the planes flying by overhead with rockets. And that's how he knew that the war had started. And he said that that was the last time he ever ate on Yom Kippur. Um, so his program was canceled and he had to find another living situation. Everyone sort of dispersed. Uh, he was very lucky that a neighbor of his was in Israel living on a kibbutz. Wouldn't you know it, that kibbutz was in the Beit Shan Valley, yeah. right next door to the kibbutz where I was living. Now, he had a Canadian girlfriend. I had an Israeli boyfriend. We didn't meet. But we were in the same place at the same time, we are sure, because uh, kibbutz near David, which is the kibbutz right near Sachna, if you've been to uh, Israel and you've been to Sachna, it's a beautiful, beautiful kibbutz. They had a youth lounge. And all the volunteers from the surrounding kibbutzim would come in the evening to this youth lounge. And um, he was there with his Canadian girlfriend. And when Avram had leave, he would come see me and we would go to this youth lounge. So we are convinced we were at the same place at the same time, even though we didn't know each other. Um, I'm very glad that the temple did this um, <laughs> evening because um, I spent a lot of time thinking about that year and what my parents went through. And um, now being a, a parent, oh, and my sister went through too, sorry, and brother. Um, because it wasn't easy for them, me getting up and just leaving. Um, I dropped out of school. I My parents lost the money for tuition, all that. But um, it was something that I felt I had to do. I'm glad I did it. I ended up staying in Israel for a year um, and then came back just a shy of a year so that my airline ticket wouldn't uh, expire. But um, that's it. Thank you, Sheila. Our, our final speaker for tonight is Yaakov Taxer. And he, he had a very interesting idea. He said, why don't we do it as a question and answer? So he's going to lead us in a Q&A session. I'll stand by him to repeat the question so people on Zoom can, can hear the question, but I hand it over now to Yaakov. Well, we'll start it. I just want to get I was born in 49 in Israel. I was born in 49 in Israel. I was drafted when I was 18 years old uh, to the infantry, not to the Air Force. And then I received the injury after massive training, four months. And 
that told me you can't stay anymore the infantry because you lost too much of your training. So we're going to take you and send you to the Air Force. Came to the Air Force, they told me you're going to be a firefighter. Firefighter, I don't know about what it means, what it is. <laughs> okay, you can't say no, you have to do what they tell you. So I became a firefighter after a few months of training. And then they needed me. Actually, I was lucky to serve in four different uh, places in Israel, uh, in different camps in the Air Force. We really, when somebody serves, they serve for one, ca one, tra one camp. Maybe like David was lucky to have two camps. Um, I served in this place where he served the same place. Uh, I, when the war break, broke out, I was actually in temple, like everybody said, and we start seeing cars driving, and that's how I found out that the war, the war broke out. Uh, I was in charge of 30 soldiers with a fire station. I was uh, actually a second of command. When my first command went to surgery, I took over, and that was exactly when the war broke out. Um, you cannot imagine what is in a Air Force base. It's like a beehive. Planes goes up and down, up and down, 24 hours a day uh, with no stop. Bombers coming in, in and out, in and out. Uh, thousands of people are walking. Even uh, we had volunteers too. Um, what I wanted to say is we have had incidents, uh, pilots died. We have a bad crash down there. They came back, they tried to save the plane. And we went in to try to save the pilots, but it was dark at night, there was no lights, uh, it was a war. Uh, the plane crashed, bombs went all over off because the plane came back, couldn't release all the bombs. We were in the middle and like I said, I was lucky to, to survive. We didn't use any fire equipment on this plane because the plane was gone. So there is a war and we cannot use our material to put off the fire while there is a war we might need it for other planes. Uh, it's very intensive, you know, it just, uh, I, like it was like yesterday, I remember the whole thing. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd like to answer. Where we after the firefighter, like we went out of base, we like when you we are in the base. We, Sorry, real quick question is where were you as a firefighter? Where do you go? Are you on a base, etc.? In a base, in the air force, in the air force, in a base. Multiple bases, or there was multiple bases. I served in multiple uh, different places during the six years. I served six years. So they needed me like a Sharm Sheikh. I was serving Sharm Sheikh. Then I served a couple of years in uh, Refidim in the middle of the desert in Sinai. There was a huge, huge camp with thousands of soldiers, not just Air Force. Uh, then I went down and I served in a, where David served and another one close to Beersheba. Then where that was the base that uh, when the, the war broke out. Uh, fortunately, we lost we lost a couple of pilots during the war. They came back trying to save the planes, and they crashed. Uh, that was you you shoot bullets, you know things happens. You know what can you do? So I served six years, and after that, I got out, and they needed me for another three months because they couldn't find any replacement. So I had to serve over a little over six years, and Finally, they got somebody else. Any questions? How different did this war feel from any other military engagement that Israel had experienced before? How did this war feel different than all other wars? It wasn't in other wars because, you know, 74, uh, 73, actually, that was my first war. So I didn't have any experience with other wars, but uh, it's basically to serve you. You train to do things, and you don't. You're not afraid. Actually, you run into 
you run into a broken plane with bombs surrounding, you don't think about yourself, you're just trying to save somebody's life. And sometimes you're lucky, sometimes not. And that's what it is. You don't think. You're young, you're trained, you have a mission to do, and you do it. How long? I don't remember how long the, the war was. How long was it? And how long was it before the Israelis knew that they were probably going to win? How long was the war? And at what point did Israel I mean, I feel they, they could win? The first two weeks was very, very uh, tense, you know. So we lost a part of the north, north of the country. The, the Syrian went really deep in. The reason they stopped with their tanks is because they thought they're going to, there is a trap. You know, they let them in and then they will surround them and, and kill them off. But uh, that was the luckiest thing that happened that they stopped. And then the Israelis start getting in with their tanks because, you know, what happened is your, uh, Rosh Hashanah, basically, we thought the war is going to start. So we were in the camps ready for the war. And then we saw that there is nothing happening. So they released every, a lot of people home and we we were home and you know it cost a lot of money to keep tankies and uh, air force and different it's not just it's not just uh, 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 soldiers it's equipment it's money where are you going to get you know it cost every day cost thousands of money to to supply supplies food and clothes and it's it's involved with a lot of stuff so they send us home, and then, like I said, when I was at the temple, I hear it like she said, airplanes and cars, cars in the street, and then we found up. So I was two miles away from my temple. I ran home, and to get to the temp, to the camp, it took me two hours because people, volunteers, picked up people to send them to the camps, and I was lucky to to get very fast to my camp, which is, was close to Beersheba at the time. The first 48 hours, we didn't sleep. We, we, was, uh, we sat in trucks. Uh, we spread all over because, you know, you can't stay in a fire station with all the equipment in case a missile comes in and destroy everything. So you can imagine that noise that we had. A, a Skyhawk is a plane that bombs. It is a very high plane. They can put a lots of bombs underneath. There is a phantom is fighting a fighting plane, and there is the mirage, the mirage that with that time with we are. So uh, the runways, there are a couple of runways. There is uh, there is we were supposed to. We had we had to learn a lot of things. We had to learn to uh, all the equipments and the planes, like to secure the plane. We were the first one to get to a plane if the if the if the pilot is injured, he cannot get out. He's supposed to know how to stop the engine, how to pull him out from the plane, how to secure the plane, because in the plane there is pins. You have to put pins inside to so make sure that you don't, they don't release any bombs or the plane start, don't, don't start shooting, you know, how to get the pilot out without pushing anything because he can eject. You have to know how to open the cockpit. On different planes, you have to learn uh, uh, there is pins in the wheels you have to put in so they, they don't lock they don't they are not unlocked because they can fall down there's a lot of things you have to learn and uh, then you have to also give orders to your, your soldiers what to do in a case of uh, and we had a lot of drills a lot of drills we had to sit with uh, asbestos clothes special asbestos clothes then we thought we we're going to be attacked from the syrian by chemical and uh, biological things so mm -hmm. Over that, in 80 degrees, you can imagine people, six, seven people sit in a truck, huge trucks covered with, ready to go to fight fires. And then over that, you have masks too, just in case. So you sweat inside, you sit. Uh, nobody thinks about food. We didn't eat for 24 hours. We didn't know what, we didn't even thought about it, you know, nothing. We were just, everybody was, Tense, you know, that's that was that was life, and uh, they're expecting for you a lot of stuff too to do, you know. So, there's a lot of drills uh, during the day is not a problem, but when you at night time, you have to know every runway, every angle, every uh, 
there's quarters of living quarters, there is a movie place, there is restaurants, there is cafeteria, there is, you have to be, you have to be aware of where you are and you have to be there in minutes. That was our job. We were isolated from the rest of the camp. We were very close to the runways. Um, we had our own kitchen. We couldn't go, we couldn't go nowhere. Uh, that was our life. Uh, it was when the plane take off at nighttime or during the day, the ground shakes, basically shakes, the noise. I got my hearing aids, you know, <laughs> I lost my hearing uh, partially from them. Six years, you know, that's uh, that's unimaginable what, uh, what uh, people go through. It's only Air Force. I was lucky I was in the Air Force, but that's my injury that I, I got my injury. I was really lucky when I was in, in infantry because otherwise, I don't know if I would be alive because a lot of uh, our friends, the soldiers that went to the infantry, went down to Egypt during the war and got killed, you know? So that was my luck. Yeah. We have time for just one final question for Yaakov. One final question. Yeah. It's not question, it's to just to explain the people that were in Israel, many of them came from the Holocaust. They have a new family. They have new kids. They build a family. They build a family. And now the children are fighting for survival. It was very difficult for the parents that the children are in the army. They lost already everybody. And now their kids are in the army. It was very difficult time. Yeah, I remember when I left home, my mother was crying, you know. And I knew... I know her feelings, you know, because going through the Holocaust, you know, and survive everything. So I told her, listen, that's our life. I have to be there. It's life for survival, yeah. but it was very difficult emotion. Also. I, I was born, I came from, I was volunteer from here on Yom Kippur. I left to Israel. And when I came to Israel, I, I was pregnant six months. I had a child two years old, and I came with my husband. We were two doctors. My mother-in-law was so mad that we came. She was feeling that he's safe, that we are in America, and we came to fight. She was very, very mad. She should have talked to my mother. <laughs> I don't say So thank you, Yaakov. So I, I told you this was our, our final speaker, but there's, there's a certain power to sharing. And I think I suspect that for, for many of, of these speakers involved, it's not something you talk about often. And so when you create a forum, all of a sudden you, you feel more and more called to, to get up and share. So we have two more speakers who want to speak. It's 750 and, and we want to end by, by eight. So if you're still willing to share Avi and Siona, but mindful of, of the time, if you're able to make it as brief as possible so we can still okay. honor our, our end time, then that would be lovely. I'd, we'd love to hear from you. And there are refreshments in the back. <laughs> I'll talk first. Okay. I happened to be in Cleveland uh, when the Yom Kippur War started. I was 26 year old. I was a senior at um, Penn College of Engineering. And I was a Navy veteran. So when the war started, uh, we were all uh, very uptight about what was going on in Israel. And uh, there was a huge student organization, Israeli student organization during that period, during the early 70s in Cleveland. And most of us wanted to go back to Israel and help with the war efforts. The people that uh, were chosen to go were uh, combat unit soldiers, uh, tank commanders, tank um, pe people that uh, were served in the tank units and uh, medical staff. So those are the ones and I, I wasn't able to go. But I wanna take you back a little bit. In Before the Yom Kippur War and before the six day war or after the six day war, the mood in Israel was such that we are invincible. No one can do anything to the Israeli military or to any of the units. 
I went to the Six Day War, and uh, the, the mood was the same. The government uh, thought also that uh, all the Arab nations surrounding Israel can never touch the Israeli forces. I happened to be on a destroyer, and on uh, July 11, 1967, we sank two Egyptian PT boats that came close to the Israeli shores. The command uh, of the Israeli military and the Navy decided that uh, the Navy has to patrol the Sinai Peninsula all the way from Ashdod to Port Said to make sure that there is no infantry of uh, Egyptian forces into the Sinai Peninsula. But basically it was a show of force that we are here and we control the <laughs> territory and no one can touch the Israeli forces. On October 21st, 1967, my destroyer got hit by missiles. It was the first missile attack in naval history. The missile was shot from a Russian Komar missile boat sunk our ship, we had a crew of 199, 47 people died during that incident. I'm one of the lucky survivors. Mm -hmm. The mood in Israel before all those wars, when I was in high school, you couldn't wait to get drafted to the military. Things are different today. A lot has to do with the political system in the country, what's happening and many, Many young kids are trying to avoid even the draft. But uh, the experiences that uh, we had, and then the, sick, the Yom Kippur War was so devastating. I lost many friends that were in their mid 20s. I mean, they were, and Judith mentioned, so many of those kids in my generation were children that were born in Europe, came to Israel with families, parents were Holocaust survivors. And uh, hopefully things are different now, but uh, it was the most devastating event in the history of the country as far as numbers of casualties. And most of the casualties were people that were in reserve. The Israeli IDF bases his, its strengths on the reservists. And believe me, when the Yom Kippur War broke, everyone wanted to go and serve. No, there were no questions. If you go to Israel, if you have time, go visit a military cemetery. I happen to be in one of, in some of them almost yearly. Matter of fact, I'm going to be there in a week and a half on the 9th of October, the 12th of October, and the 18th. I have memorial services for military personnel that perished while my destroyer sank. But if you look at those graves, those are kids that are ages from sure. 18 to 20, 22. And many of them were born outside of the country. And it will give, will leave you a mark how devastating those wars are. And I hope that we don't have any more wars. I mean, but uh, the experience of the Yom Kippur War and the 67 War were, were amazing on the state of Israel. And... Um, like I said, we were here. The, there was the day after the war broke out. I remember Taylor Road Synagogue has a huge rally to to collect money and and uh, big efforts to help. And uh, I told many people before that without the help of the United States, Israel couldn't survive that sixty that Yom Kippur War, because a lot of the equipment that was used came from the United States. And, and it shows you, you know, the mood, you know, they thought after the 67 war that nothing can happen to this country. So we need to live with strength, but hopefully no wars. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. Uh, and thank you to all of our speakers who spoke today. Really your, your candor and your, your bravery, um, it, it, it couldn't be more touching and and we really appreciate all that went into being able to share your stories with us and thank you everybody for being here to bear witness to these stories and to carry 
the memory forward. I want to invite Rabbi Hal up for, for a conclu uh, closing remark and just to say thank you again to our committee and to all of you for making this evening so special. Thank you, Rabbi Jacobs. Um, thanks to everyone who made not just tonight so special, night of testimony and witness, of story, of history and remembrance, but also the Yom Kippur story walk. Many people sort of were behind the scenes to make this an incredible gift really to our congregation to walk through the history of the Yom Kippur War. Um, growing up, I was always taught, I was born in 1974, so post the war, <laughs> that Israel won every war, but I wasn't taught the price for every war. And in particular, this war, the Yom Kippur War. Uh, almost every single trip that I make to Israel, I make a stop at Latrun. If you haven't been to Latrun, I highly recommend going there. That is the Memorial Museum for the Armored Corps of Israel, the Tank Corps. Um, and um, I... There's a photo in the display that you'll see, which is a photo taken from a family mission that I was on from the Jewish Community Federation about 10 years ago, taken by our member, Louis Chaitin. There we were guided through the tank memorial by a um, soldier currently who is currently serving in the tank brigade. And the photo is a photo of our young children. And in particular, one of them is our son, Ari, who was age seven at the time, at the wall, specifically of the names of the soldiers who were killed during the Yom Kippur War. And that is a very holy place for me to visit. And uh, every Yom Kippur, I think about it, and in particular, this on the 50th anniversary. Uh, thank you all. It's not easy to talk about this but it's necessary, it's necessary to hear. Thank you for sharing your history and your testimony. There are also many others for our congregation that you'll that have been recorded, that if you go through, you can read some of their exhibit and you can go online and there's a, a you can scan and hear their story or read their story. Um, again, with gratitude to all who did this, East Corps, we remember and we will always remember and never forget. And uh, Am Yisrael Chai, of course. And we're going to conclude with the singing of Hatikva. Please rise and we'll ask our cantor. Um, also, I just want to give a very big thank you, Rabbi Jacobs. This is really one of the first big assignments I gave to you when you started just really two months ago. Um, so thank you for taking this under your helm. Great volunteer for Incredible committee volunteers are Israel at 75 committee, which gave its blessing. Uh, I'm not going to name every name, but thank you. Oh, Lord, by labor, <laughs> Sophia, oh no, I will Leo tam khoshi be am sinu e sion biru shala Thank you and please take some time at the story walk and uh I'm sure everyone who spoke and gave testimony is open to uh, talking with them sharing with them for those online, thank you for joining us. Yeah, this is recorded. The story walk is going to be here until the end after through the first days of Sukkot until next Monday, approximately.